Oh, I've got it coming. I can feel the comments. Stick to the melted rocks, you oil-soaked swarf monkey. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blundy Hacks. This is kind of a bonus video on the die filer. I was not expecting to do another one in this series, but I needed a stand or a bench of some sort to get this thing set up on permanently. And uh, well, it turns out that it needed a little bit of re-engineering as well. So more on all of that right now. You can see I've got the die filer sitting on the floor at the moment, which is less convenient than you might think. And I've got this space at the end of this central workbench that I think is kind of perfect for a little bit of a stand or an additional table of some sort where I could put the die filer and probably another small machine or two that I have my eye on. I set out on this video with the best of intentions to build a small steel workbench similar in design to my big bench that the lathe is sitting on but with materials that I have on hand, which is to say 2 inch angle iron and a 3 16 inch steel plate for the top, and some stringers on the bottom, a little shelf down there, some stringers at the top for support. I did a little sketch here, I made all of the drawings and measurements and everything. I even went and got some wheels online. These are double locking heavy duty casters. I like everything in the center of the shop to be on wheels so I can move it out of the way for larger projects. And everything was going to plan. I knew I had a whole bunch of this two inch angle iron underneath my storage rack. So I dug that out. This whole plan was predicated on the fact that I really wasn't gonna have to buy any steel because I had, I figured about 20 feet of this two inch angle left. So I was gonna make the whole bench out of this. Life was gonna be great. I'd just have to go down to my local welding shop, get them to cut a piece of plate for me, and I'd be all set, knock out this bench, call it an afternoon project. Well, it turns out the 20 feet of this two inch angle iron that I have is more like six feet, and it's in two awkward pieces. This kind of derailed my plans. I was gonna to have to order basically all of the steel to build this thing, which was gonna be a couple hundred bucks, and, then I started looking at how much work this was really going to be. I'm sure I'm the last person on earth to realize this, but building a small bench is actually the same amount of work as building a large bench because the corners and joints is where all the work is, and there's the same number of those in a small table as there is in a big one. I know. I'm shocked too. So what did I do about this? I punted. I made the mistake of looking on the Canadian Tire website, and wouldn't you know, they have a little portable rolling tool stand that is the perfect size and cost less than I would have paid for the steel to build this myself. And it's got a really nice solid hardwood top to boot. I don't know how they make this stuff so cheaply, but it's honestly really quite good. The casters on it are single locking, which is not great, and the bearings are certainly nothing to write home about in these things, so I might replace them with better casters, but they are heavier duty than I expected. The casters I bought for this project are better, but they're too small and the wrong mounting style to swap in easily, so those casters will go in the drawer. I'll use them for some other project someday, and let's get this workbench assembled. This thing is surprisingly well made for the price. Everything is 16 gauge steel, powder coated, all riv nuts, no self-tapping screws or anything chintzy. Surprisingly good for what it cost. So this project has pivoted to let's take a commercial workbench and modify it for something like mounting a die filer. This is a good excuse to talk about the trade-offs with buying things versus building them. I think nowadays certainly you're never going to save money by building something yourself. The home gamer simply can't compete with how cheaply we can manufacture things nowadays. And honestly, the quality has gotten pretty decent with this cheap stuff. So really the only reason to build something yourself is if you will enjoy the process, which is the reason that I typically build things. You've seen me build things like toolmakers clamps and such, which you know, cost me $50 worth of steel and a couple of weeks of my time, and you can buy them on Amazon for $8. So obviously, saving money is not the reason to make your own tools and furniture. So you might also do it if you need something special that can't be bought, such as was the case with my material storage rack that I built. There just simply wasn't anything on the market that fit in the exact space I needed and had the exact configuration I needed. In this situation, frankly, I've done my time on building heavy steel shop furniture. It's a lot of work, and I knew I was not going to enjoy the process. And what I need here is nothing special. I just need a sturdy bench. So I think my time is much better spent modifying something commercial and then moving on to other tasks that I'm going to enjoy a lot more, like building a locomotive. I knew I wanted to mount the motor under the bench, which was a traditional method of doing this when power tools had their motors separate. Mounting the motor underneath the bench protects it from chips, filings, etc. 
and also makes it easy to tension the belt because the weight of the motor is working in your favor then. Step one is going to be to flip the end bells on the motor around. I'm going to be mounting this upside down and you want the lubrication cups to be pointed upward so that gravity will feed the oil into the felt inside the lubricators and not all over the floor where it's not doing a whole lot of good for the motor. This is nothing radical. These motors are designed for you to be able to do this because the tools and appliances and such that they are used in involve mounting the motor in all sorts of orientations. Very smart people thought of this problem and designed the motor to account for it. This motor is not super heavy, but it is just heavy enough that you really don't want to be trying to hold it up underneath a bench and get it lined up, put in mounting screws, and so on. So I made a makeshift transmission jack from my mechanic stool so that I could hold it in place and move it around, figure out exactly where I want this thing to go. I need to decide where the die filer is going to go on top and then get the motor in roughly the correct area underneath. This will all be somewhat adjustable, so I just have to be in the ballpark. While it was hanging under the bench, I marked the footprint of it with tape, give or take. Again, this is just fairly approximate, and now I can figure out how to mount it. The plan is to use this door hinge I found in my parts bin to act as the belt tensioning mechanism. Using a hinge of some sort for this is a very standard way to do this. I removed the top and put it over here on the workbench because it's going to be a lot easier to do all of this upside down instead of fighting gravity working underneath. I'm going to enlarge the mounting holes on this hinge because I'm going to use some bolts instead of the wood screws that this hinge is of course designed for. Float lock vise for the win here. This float lock vise is one of the best things I think I've ever made on this channel, honestly. I don't know why more people don't use them, quite honestly. I have never seen a better drill press vise. This thing is really fantastic. It holds everything, weird shapes, etc. And it's never, never let me down. Just love this thing. The real power of the float lock vise is this moment here where I can loosen the clamp, swing it over to the next hole, line it up easily on the drill, tighten the clamp back down, and continue. An operation like this with a traditional drill press vise is a lot of fiddly clamping and unclamping and shifting and trying to get the holes lined up and so on. The float lock makes this so easy. Why don't more people use these? Check my playlists for the video series where I made this, which includes the free plans, so you can make this yourself. An eagle-eyed viewer pointed out that the mounting holes in the motor base are so oversized because they're intended to have rubber grommets in them for vibration isolation. That sounds like a very good idea. For now, I'm going to hard mount it, but if there's too much vibration in the bench when I'm done, then I may go back and put some rubber in there. This almost works, except the bolt heads hit the hinge underneath and require that the motor sit way up in the air on the other side in order to get clearance. So I'd need about a 4-inch mounting system on the other side. That's way too high. However, if I mount the hinge at 90 degrees, like so, then the motor can sit horizontally with very little lift required on the opposite side. So I think that's what I'm going to do. I need a way to mount that hinge at a 90 degree angle. And I dug through the scrap bin and I found this incredibly perfectly sized piece of angle iron already cut. Look at that. It's even got one hole in it already. I think that'll be perfect for mounting the hinge thusly. I took it over to the drill press and put a whole bunch more holes in it and bolted the hinge to it. I used the one hole and then drilled two more to make room for screws to mount it to the underside of the bench. Wood screws are not the strongest things in the world, especially holding a big electric motor upside down like they're going to be doing. So I'm using three number 12 wood screws, very big beefy wood screws. I think that should be enough. And this is hardwood, so it should hold very well. The third hole that was already there was not well aligned with the other two, so the taper on the underside of the screw head insisted on pulling the bracket out of square. No amount of loosening the others and tightening them in different order would work to keep it square. So I put a washer under that screw. Not the most elegant solution, but it'll be under the bench for its entire life, and I won't tell anyone if you don't. To mount the other side, I'm going to put some nut inserts into the wood. I've got these hammer-in style, which are not my favorite. I don't think they're as strong as the thread-in type, but these are the only ones that I had, and I had exactly two of them left, and I want to use them up because I don't like them. So here we are. I think they'll be strong enough. The key to these is the pilot drill size has to be exactly correct because they rely on the friction of those little wedges on the sides to hold them in position. And you really have to whale on these to hammer them in. They are an extremely, extremely tight fit. 
And once again, that pilot drill size has to be perfect or they will be either too loose and not hold well, or you'll never get them hammered in. Very glad to have used those up and I will never buy them again. Just buy the screw in type. They are much better. Now you can kind of see how this is going to work. I've got long threaded machine screws that will go into those inserts and I've got nuts on either side with a stack of washers to take up the giant holes where the rubber bushings would be. And this will allow me to basically create threaded studs on this side and then the nuts can be shifted up and down to tension the belt and clamp the motor in position once it's in the right place. The weight of the motor may be enough to tension the belt, but it may not, and if it isn't, then I can use the upper nuts to pull down on the motor. It's also good to have nuts on both sides, even if the weight of the motor is enough, because if you rely on the weight of the motor hanging on the belt, then the motor does tend to bounce, because of course belts are somewhat elastic. You can see this, for example, on my horizontal bandsaw, where they rely on a single direction of tension to hold the motor in position and the belt tight. The belt and motor do tend to bounce. Of course, we need a slot in the table for the belt to run through, so I will mark out where that needs to go next. I'm doing everything in reverse order of how difficult it is to get things in the right position. Getting the motor mounted underneath the bench in the correct position was the most difficult thing, so I started with that. Next, getting the slot in the right place relative to the motor is slightly less tricky, but still fairly tricky, so that goes next. And then the easiest thing is to mount the die filer on top of the bench, and that can be adjusted a little bit to account for whatever errors I make in the previous two processes. Now it's time for some very embarrassing woodworking. You are not going to enjoy this if you are a woodworker, because I do not know what I'm doing. However, I'm going to do my best to avoid tear out on the top of the bench, because I kind of have to drill this slot from this side. I've put some blue tape on there, and I've clamped a backing board on the far side to hopefully minimize tear out. In hindsight, what I maybe should have done was drill the series of pilot holes from this side and then used those pilot holes to do the paddle bit drilling from the other side, which would have eliminated tear out on the side that I care about. But, you know, live and learn. Also, a Forstner bit would be a better choice probably for this, but I didn't have one in the right size and I did have the paddle bit, so here we are. After chain drilling out the slot, I then got out the one and only chisel that I own. Yes, I literally own exactly one chisel, but it is a good one and it's very, very sharp. So I was able to clean up the slot and square up the sides of it to make it into a presentable looking slot. I left the ends round because I thought that looked nice. Again, apologies to the woodworkers. Feel free to make jokes at my expense at this point because, you know, I've earned some comeuppance there over the years for all the fun that I've poked at the woodchucks on this channel. What are you doing? Don't ever ask commenters for abuse. You're gonna get a lot of it anyway. All right, moment of truth. Let's see how my tear out prevention measures worked or if they did. Peel the tape off here. Survey says, eh, pretty good. I got some, a couple of spots there don't look too good, but I think it's acceptable. This is all going to be underneath a belt guard anyway. I cleaned it up as best I could, made it reasonably presentable. I was going to show you close-ups so you could inspect the work and give me your opinions, but that's weird. None of my camera lenses would focus on it. I just I couldn't get a close-up shot for you on this one. Sorry. Next, I should be able to get the motor mounted underneath and position the die filer relative to that. If I did all of my measuring correctly, then the belt will line up with the slot. I guess we're going to find out. Hopefully this is the last time I need to bolt the motor up underneath here. There is a fair bit of adjustment on all of these mounts as well, so if I don't get the slot alignment perfect, I do have a good half inch or so of room to knock things around. I figured it's probably a good idea to give it a test run at this point, see if the mounting is solid enough, if it vibrates or anything like that. Yeah, that seems to run quite well. I think that'll be just fine. I verified that the lubricators are easily accessible as well. That's, of course, an important design goal. That seems to work just fine. All right, time to get the die filer positioned on the bench. In my initial mock-up, I knew I wanted it roughly in this area. The exact location will depend on where I happen to get the motor and where the slot happened to land. 
Hopefully I can get the belt straight and it'll still run through the slot without rubbing anywhere. I did cut it a little close on the width of that slot, so hopefully this works out. Again, I do have adjustment in the mounting of the motor and the die filer, so I can tweak as needed. Of course, the belt I had was an inch too short, so I had to go buy longer ones. Went and bought a couple of sizes. Belts are so cheap and saves me having to do an extra trip to the auto parts store in case the first guess isn't correct. Measuring V-belts is really quite difficult because it's hard to measure exactly where they're going to sit on the pulleys. You can use string or flexible tape or other things, but you never get it exactly right. I think that's going to work, but before I mount that for good, I need to do that re-engineering that I talked about on this thing. It turns out the brass plug on the bottom has been leaking. It is not oil tight as it was supposed to be. There's no seal or anything in the design of that plug, and I think it's just supposed to rely on a close fit and the Loctite to seal it in place. And well, I came out after this thing sat in the shop for a couple of days and all the oil was in a puddle underneath it. So I'm going to get this plug out and see what we can do about that. A little bit of heat breaks the Loctite, and then I used a brass drift on the file rod itself. I disconnected it from the yoke inside and just used the file rod itself to tap the brass plug out without disturbing the lower bearing. Hopefully the heat that I applied did not disrupt the Loctite on the bearing. I don't think it did, but I you know, guess we won't know for sure. My thought was maybe I can add an O-ring to this to create a better seal. So I went over to my hardware cabinet. And in one of my drawers, oh goodies here, I've got a selection of O-rings. I figured I could probably find one here that would work. Now my thought is I'll put an O-ring groove on the outside of this cap, and that'll allow it to seal on the inside of the casting. It's not practical to cut a matching O-ring groove inside the casting, so I'm going to have to do it entirely with a groove on this part. I put it in the forejaw and dialed it up as best I could. Machinery's Handbook has all of the tables and formulas to calculate exactly what the dimensions of a groove should be for a given O-ring, if you want to go and look that up. But you know how thick that book is? Who's got time for that? Instead, I just eyeballed it. This'll be fine, right? And yeah, that tool holder is close, but hey, in machining, clearance is clearance. Clearance. My goal was to create a groove that was slightly shallower than the diameter of the O-ring so that the ring is proud of the surface and slightly wider than the o-ring so that the ring has somewhere to squish into. That's the basic idea of how o-rings work. The o-ring is supposed to squish and expand into a groove that's slightly larger than the ring itself is. That seems like that might be a bit okay. I aimed for the shallow side so I can enlarge this in both dimensions if needed. Let's see if this fits in there. Eh, it's tight. I think that might not work. I put an extra chamfer on the hole on the underside to help ease it in, and I put a little bit of liquid persuasion on there as well. Let's see if I can get that in there. I want it to be as tight as possible while still being able to go in. And a little tappy tap tap, and it started to go, but then yeah, I started to tear the ring on the edge of the groove. A clear sign that that groove is not deep enough or wide enough. I took it back to the lathe, I added about 5 thou of depth and 10 thou of width to give the o-ring more room to squish into, and let's give that another try. Liquid Persuasion. Oh, yeah, that feels like that's gonna go. That's much better. A little tappy tap tap, and that looks good. That ring went all the way in, no apparent damage. Then I cleaned up the outer surface that's remaining and added Loctite to that area to Hold that cap in place once again. Did that work? Eh, I'll know in a couple of days. If I come out in the shop and the die filer is looking up at me, all embarrassed with its ears flat sitting in a puddle of its own fluids, well, then I'll know it didn't work. And I refilled the oil and I can get it back together. I actually changed oils here. If you watched the previous videos in this series, you might know that I used manual transmission oil in it that has sulfur in it. My kind viewers pointed out that uh, sulfurated oils are bad for brass parts, which of course this thing has. Well, bronze parts, but same thing. So I actually changed to what's known as a GL4 gear oil, which is safe for brass and bronze parts. There's always more to learn about oil. All right, here goes. I'm going to tension the belt for the first time and see if this actually works. The belt looks pretty well centered in the slot. It's not rubbing anywhere. Fire it up. Oh, seems okay. Nothing's rubbing. 
The belt seems to be running straight and it seems happy, so I think I'm going to go ahead and mark this position for the die filer. It's at least very close. Again, I can adjust this all a little bit if needed, but I think this is going to be the spot for me. I like where it's sitting on the bench, so I think this is a win. Once again, I'm using large wood screws to hold the die filer down. Honestly, the die filer doesn't need much at all to hold it in place. The thing is so heavy and it doesn't have a lot of tension or forces on it, even from the belt. So it actually stays in place without much for attachment, but some big wood screws will be more than enough. Okay, here goes. Yeah, look at that. That seems to be running just fine. There is a fair amount of vibration making its way into the bench, which makes it a little bit noisier than it would otherwise be. So I may go back and rubber mount things. We'll see how it is once the storage shelf underneath the bench is loaded up full of stuff, because that's also going to dampen it quite a bit. Right now, that steel shelf underneath is kind of a big snare drum. But it die files. Now, let's see about protecting my fingers, because I've grown kind of attached to them. I have this stuff on my storage shelf. It's kind of a decorative brass mesh that I bought a while back, and it's kind of terrible stuff that's really useless for anything, so I just kind of want to use it up, and I scientifically determined that it will function as a safety device, so I think this will be fine, and I'll be once again glad to use this stuff up. Plus, I think the brass actually complements the color of the machine kind of nicely, so yeah, it'll be good. Took a few measurements to figure out how big to make this thing. I'm going to make it in three parts, a front, a back, and a strip that goes around the top to join the two sides together. I decided to sketch this out with a little bit of cardboard aided design. Got some cardstock here and I'm going to lay this out and uh, then I'll use this to template the sheet metal. I really should buy a proper compass. I'm just lost without one, but I keep doing this instead. I left extra at the bottom for a mounting flange, and this decorative mesh stuff has kind of a thick border at the bottom, which will be perfect for that flange. So I aligned the template thusly. This stuff is kind of tricky to mark and cut because of all the elaborate clover shapes that are punched out of it. I don't really know what this stuff is for or why Home Depot sells it, but they do, and I bought it. So 10 years later, here we are, and once again, I'm really glad to get rid of this stuff because it turns out to be useless, as neat as it looks. After cutting out the shape on the bandsaw, I went to my little brake to put the flange on the bottom. This little sheet metal machine has been a good investment, I think. It's a good size for the types of things that I typically make, and when you need a sheet metal tool like this, you really need it. There are some basic sheet metal operations that are really quite difficult to do any other way. I over-tipped that a little bit, so I squared it back up using the little press feature at the bottom, which is actually intended to hold the piece still for the shear, but it works quite well as a light duty press as well. A quick test fit suggests I didn't totally botch that, so uh, let's continue. I modified the same template that I made for the front to fit around the shaft on the back. It seems like that's going to work. It's a little tall because of course the flange will be tipped at the bottom. Made that piece the same way as you just saw the other one. Then I lined up the pieces got them basically straight and figured out how wide the joiner strip around the middle needs to be. I also took a measurement with a fabric tape. This just has to be approximate because I'm going to cut it over length. If you needed it exact, you could of course do the math because I know what the radius is and so on, but measuring was easier than math. This is the point where my plan started to fall apart a little bit. You can see I pivoted to rivets, a standard rivet pivot, because I was planning to solder this material together, but it turns out it's not actually brass. It's painted aluminum. Yeah, thanks Home Depot. So I can't solder it, and it turns out this stuff's too kind of sparse, if you will, for rivets. There really wasn't enough meat here for rivets. So what I ended up doing was cutting tabs on the sides of the strip, as you see there, and I'm going to join it together like a tin toy. I'm going to make tabs and fold them over. And if you're wondering why it's cut at a weird angle and the tabs are all crazy looking, it's because I didn't have enough of this material left for the length of strip that I needed. I was able to get it done by cutting a diagonal strip across the remaining scrap that I had, 
and I just barely got this done, but it made for a weird looking cut and the tabs had to be kind of crazy shapes. So I roughed in the tabs initially and then I fine tuned them with some nippers once I figured out where the strips kind of landed on the adjacent pieces so I could have little tabs that lined up with the holes on the sides of the parts, which would give me something to fold over and hammer into place. This worked better than it had any right to, frankly. The end result is reasonably skookum, which is surprising considering how spindly this material is. I'm not going to say it's the best built thing I've ever done, but I did get to use up this crappy material and I didn't have to do it twice. So I think I barely pulled moderate success from the jaws of certain defeat. If I did my job right, this should now fit and I can mark and drill for mounting screws. Yeah, look at that. That's not terrible. Once mounted, I gave it a little test drive to make sure nothing's rubbing or it isn't going to rattle or something like that. And yeah, this seems good. It's quiet and nothing's touching. I think that's a belt guard. Quick safety check. Yeah, look at that. Finger safe. Scientifically proven. I need some decent electrical now. For that, I picked up this guy. It's a machinery switch with a built-in e-stop paddle. This was eh, 35 bucks on Amazon. A little spendy, but you know, it's safety equipment, so probably best not to skimp. I attached it to the leg of the table with a standard electrical box, crimped up some connectors, wired that bad boy in. That was very quick and easy to install. And hey, look at that. It works. And it's die filing, just like it should. This switch is kind of nice with that built-in paddle for e-stop. It's an off switch and it's right at knee level there if I need to shut it off in a hurry for some reason. The final touch was suggested by a patron. I enclosed the entire motor and belt in a cage. This is literally just me googling wire basket and the dimensions I needed. I think this came from a sporting goods store. It's for storing dodgeballs or something, but it's metal and it acts as a belt guard. And more importantly, it's going to protect the motor from the inevitable collapsing pile of crap that's going to get stored on the shelf under this table. Well, there it is. The die filer finally installed and mounted, ready to use in a convenient place in my shop. And I now have a little bit more storage and room for another couple of small machines to be permanently mounted next to it. I'm looking forward to doing some real work with this machine. I think it's going to be a great addition to my model building enterprises. Well, thank you very much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons who make all of this content possible. You guys are so awesome, and I'm so, so grateful for the continued support over all these years. And I will see you next time.